This is the Living in Clarity podcast. My name is Brandon Fisher. This is Coach Radner. And today we have very special guest, Adrian Gold Davis. Hi, welcome to the show. I am so excited. You can't believe it. I mean, we've been trying to get you one for a long time. You're not easy to get, but we're very blessed to have you today. Are you kidding? It's, my schedule is insane, but I have been looking forward to this. I'd love the opportunity to talk to you guys. So thank you for having me. <laughs> What'd you tell them better? Yeah, so to give the introduction, um, you used to be a host, uh, or you used to be a TV personality and celebrity in Canada TV in fashion, style, and beauty. Yeah. And now you have shifted into being a speaker, uh, really a worldwide speaker, and you work for Momentum. We just had the opportunity to hear you recently speak, and I was blown away by the messaging. You could like, you could almost feel the whole audience, uh, the connection to you, and the tears in their eyes. I think gave made it clear how strong and impactful your messaging are. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Adrian, I, I sometimes go back to America and talk to people who've been on these trips, yeah. and they all say to me, I just love Adrian. I just love Adrian. I mean, I hear this, like, this is like months and months after a trip. It's a wonderful thing, but it's a shame that my children never got the memo. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm not so wonderful at home, and they don't return my text. But uh, is that a millennial thing? Just please tell me. Yes, we don't respond to messages. Sorry, especially mommy. Especially mommy messages. <laughs> It's really nice to hear. It really is. Yeah, I went from fashion, lifestyle, beauty, all of those things for many, many years. And I fell in love with all things Jewish and made a huge career pivot. It's interesting. My husband says one day I should write a book and we should call it, are you ready? From Prada to Prayer. I think that's uh, an amazing name. I got to use that. That's really good. I thought it was good. Well, yeah. that should, no, yours. That should yours, be her yeah. book. It's, mine, yeah. it's, mine, it's, mine. it's yours. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's start going back then. How did you originally get involved in the TV scene? Well, actually, it was also, you know, in those days, I would have called it a coincidence or fluke. Today, I call it, you know, Hushka. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but in those days, I was working as a management consultant in the 80s to the fashion industry. My job was I would go into retail chains that were struggling many times in those days when brick and mortar stores were, you know, the, where, that was all we had. That's all you had Yeah, you... People would pay what we call percentage rent based on, do you know anything about this or how? A little bit. For, for getting space in the store, right? Well, no, it's about how much how much um, volume you do, and then you take you pay a percentage of that becomes your rent. So it's always in the best interest of the people leasing to have high volume in their stores because it does lower the, the anyway, this is, this is a paradigm from many years ago, but I used to be hired to go into a location to turn its staff around, to turn its merchandise and its merchandising around, to create the right atmosphere. In the 80s, you could make money if you just sneezed on something. It was so easy to do. But I really had um, an understanding of the zeitgeist of the whole industry. And I did that for years. And one day, the owner of this particular chain I was working for at this time, happened to be a shoe, a uh, very large Canadian shoe chain, was supposed to go on a morning show and um, speak about this season's trends in shoes, in footwear. This was a TV show or a it's radio a show? show, okay. a very, really well-watched, you know, really well-watched. In those days, in Canada, that is is a smaller market, obviously, than America, but big in Canada. And um, so she said, I can't go. One of my kids is sick because as mothers, you know, you can have a television appearance, but if your kid has a flu, you, you know, it's canceled. Mm -hmm. So she said, could you go in my place? And I said, uh, sure. I remember looking down and going, yeah, I'm not having a pretty day, okay? I'm having a fat <laughs> day, I'm having a tired day, I'm having pimples day. I was young, right? I was in my 20s. And she said, just go, they'll do makeup for you. So and do, was this your first time ever? First time ever. In front of a camera, wow. Yes. So I, I remember taking a taxi down to the TV station. Was this in Toronto? Or? This is in Toronto. And I arrived at the station, and I was so late. The traffic was so bad that there was no time for makeup. Oh, no. Mm. And, but you know what? Really, this was the beginning of everything changing for me. Let me explain. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to make it on looks. I really did not look nice that day. And the producer said to me, I'm so sorry there's no time for makeup. But, you know, just don't look in the monitor. In other words, don't look for yourself. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I hated her. And they, she said, really, just just bring your personality. It was the first time I ever heard a person who wasn't Jewish and has no understanding of the concept of chen tell me. Chen, which is 
Yeah. Defined as, I, I would translate it as grace. Is that how you define it? Yeah. Grace, inner beauty, so to speak. She said, bring that out. Bring your full self to it and don't look in the monitor. It's a great lesson. It really and truly was long before I was ever interested in those kind of lessons. Sure. And that's what I did. And I rocked it. And at the end, the producer said to me, you're really good. I said, thank you very much. And he said, would you like to come back? And I said, sure. Yeah. And so... With makeup. <laughs> I'd like to lose 20 pounds, please, before I got on. Would it be all right if I'll fix my hair? You know, so I was just... I was completely insecure, driven by a statics young girl who got this break. And you know what's sad about this was continually, as I started to go more and more, I became a regular and then on other shows and then a network offered me my own show and I took over. It was on the morning uh, news and lifestyle show called Canada AM, which is you know, virtually identical to, what do you call it? Today the, show. The Today Show or Good Morning America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did that for years. People used to write in constantly, all the time. And here's what they'd say. Dear Miss Gold, you're not very pretty, but we love watching. You. Oh my you gosh. Guys. Dear Miss Why would they say that? People are idiots. Dear Miss Gold, you look like you need to lose 20 pounds, but it makes us feel better about ourselves, and so we love watching you. I don't know. Worlds. Dear Miss Gold, you make it look like any average looking Jewish woman could be famous. Huh. Oh. It used to be. This is not nice at all. Oh, it's not nice at all, but it was their form of a backhanded compliment because the beauty of the month came and went and came and went and came and went. And for 15 years, I worked in television. Wow. Because of what was going on inside. Because that one piece of advice you got before you even started. It changed everything. It changed everything. Essentially, now as a Jewish educator, I would say to tell somebody to lead soul first. Lead soul first. But I didn't have the language for that in those days. What does lead soul first mean? For me, leading soul first means recognizing that you are a soul fundamentally being carried in a host body, please God, for 120 years. Oh, man. Yeah. And that while we have a responsibility to that body, since it hosts a very holy piece of God, there's no reason why that body should not be beautified, should not be exercised, should not be treated with the honor and respect and kavod that it is. But it isn't your identity. The piece of you that yearns to connect with another human being, if you can get in touch with it, if you can drive your connection, your communications with another person through what your heart and your emotions and your intellect tell you will create a bond, your soul so overpowers your physicality that you can blind people with the light that every single human being has inside. That is a great lesson of clarity. Now we know why she's so good. That, yeah, that's <laughs> so good. Just lead with the soul. And when you were not doing that on the TV at the time, or when did well, you? No, or she got you like a race out through, but so right it was actually I didn't know consciously that it was a Jewish principle. Okay, but I will tell you that, and it was interesting because that original "I'll bring my personality," you know, came as a response to being insecure about my physicality. What I learned from that is that there is something far more enticing and far more compelling than physical beauty, which is a question of chemistry anyway. I mean, we all look at each other and there is a, there is a response to the physicality of another person based on old brain and old childhood things. Having said that, the ability to connect with someone, to truly connect with someone comes from a very different source. And I didn't understand what I was doing. But somehow that producer gave me some very good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. I know I'm beautiful now. Don't Great. worry. I know I'm old and I could be your mother. <laughs> but when you spend, as I have, the last 20 years, 25 years working on building my inner world, I feel if I started again in television, which I have no intention of doing, but if I, if I started again... I think that I would be more confident and be more physically attractive. I don't think I would get those messages. Very interesting. And that's because you worked on the inner beauty and that will show. It does show. It does. it does. I think it does. You know, obviously you're not a mother, but you're a father. Yes. Yes. 
you know how it is, like when your kids are in love with you, which they are for the first five years, and after that, <laughs> it's a little other story. Anyway, when your kids are in love with you, it doesn't matter how bad your breath is. They crawl into bed with you. Morning breath, you stink. They don't care. They're so in love with you, they'd crawl into your mouth if they could. <laughs> Everything about you is beautiful and compelling and wonderful. And it's an extraordinary feeling. You see that your children react to the essence of who you are. They do. You know, until they start to separate. What happens at that at that point? Well, they start to separate. What, well, what creates the separation that changes that after five years old? Well, they start when as they grow, they get more they get more independent. They want they want independence, right? They don't want to be so they don't want to be so close. They want to do things on their own. So you go from a director to a you know to a supervisor, eventually to a consultant. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. And but yet being a supervisor means you know, or consultant means you still have you still have you can still drive. Your children, the way you act, you know, children do what you do. You, you have to, if you, want, if you want your kids to have a great marriage, you have to do it. You have to show them a great marriage. You know, if you want your kids to have self-confidence and, and positive self-esteem, you have to have positive self-esteem. In fact, I just, it's funny, I gave a class on self-esteem today, and I'm, I'm going to guess that most people who have low self-esteem, a lot of it comes from their parents. Not all of it, but. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm sort of conflicted on that concept yeah because I, I i believe that every soul comes into this world with its own bag of what's the world i want to use its own bag of tools but also its own pecla of issues pecla oh she defined that class earlier yiddish word pecla right. is like a bag of candy the kids get yeah, but instead yeah. of candy, you get issues. Yeah, okay. Whether they are from family of origin, as Daniel just said, whether they are, you know, last incarnations of your soul that needed to be worked out, whatever sure. they are. Yeah. You know, there is that. I have seen, and this is so important for clarity's sake, especially if there are parents listening, I have seen spectacular parents with great marriages raise children who... And I've seen parents who are neglecting or overfunctioning or punitive raise spectacular human beings. So, yes, I think you're absolutely right that we model what we want to see. One of the deepest, most painful times in my life was after investing every single iota of my will, my heart, my morals, my ethics into my own children, was watching them make choices that were different than mine. First, it was deeply galling and it made me angry. But what I came to realize was all that righteous indignation was not really love. It was control. Right. That's a clear concept. You want some clarity in life? Stop suffering from the delusion, that's what Einstein called it, of control. You're not in control. There's so much to say about control. It's something that as parents... You have to exert control as their kids, as their babies. They depend on you. And how do you start to change from being the force of their control into giving them the control? How does that shift occur? I, well, I, I, first, as a parent, I think that one of the successes of being a parent is when your children start to make decisions based on how you would think. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, how, that's how I look at it. Like if I'm not there and they say, would my father you know, do this or that? And they make decisions based. Not, they're not. It's all subconscious. But I think is that when they when it, when they want to emulate you as a parent, as a child, want to emulate your parents because they love their parents. They have a great relationship. I think it's all based on relationship that you want to emulate people that you love. Just like a movie star, you know, like when when there could be a lot of high schoolers who want to do that though. No, no, but even though you know, you know, okay, maybe what you said, maybe when they're teenagers, and we all, everyone goes through friction, right? The friction the teenagers go through, but. You hope that you've done enough positive reinforcement to your children that when they're in their 20s and 30s, that it starts to click in. They start to make decisions based on how you would make decisions and not... They may make decisions in the, in the realm of morality, right? but not necessarily in behaviors. And this is, this is something that really has to be accepted. This is also true of your spouse. You know, the therapists say that people marry within one or two differentiation points of each other, which means that they're really, even though one always claims to have the higher bar, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the, yeah, I'm the more evolved one that in fact, most people are within two differentiation points. And actually, I remember therapists telling my husband and other people actually marry within two IQ points of each other. 
I must wow. I, I think men marry their mothers and women marry their fathers. That's I don't know. I could be wrong. Do you know that, 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 that that's the kind of person they're going to marry? When they see someone like when a woman, woman sees someone like her father, that's who she falls in love with. You know, for better or for worse, I was talking about this last week, uh, you know, that Harville Hendricks, the world famous marriage counselor who wrote Getting the Love You Want and Keeping the Love You Get, said that we have a bat like radar and that that bat like radar is to find unfinished business of childhood or we are attracted subconsciously to those who remind us of our original caretakers for good and for bad. And that it pulls us, the familiarity pulls us. And then in our adult relationships, we're supposed to have the chance to work through that which we didn't have the power to do with our original caretakers. It's an interesting theory. But for me, all of these theories, nothing worked. For my husband and I, our early years of our marriage were difficult until we found an operating system a way of looking at the values of life together that was bigger than what is often the narcissistic behavior that love is just to be my beloved just do you want me do you love me do you love me do you love me do you love me you common you have to have common meaningful goals and values that's it that's it that's the key that's it that's the operating system that's well yeah you have to have common meaningful that do not be on physical because if you think our meaningful goal is to you know bigger but Big a built house in Boca Raton and go to the country club. That is not the goals I'm talking about. I'm talking beyond physical, beyond this world. Because if you think about, think about how many people you know who are married. In fact, it's an epidemic. People are married in their twenties. I mean, they're married twenty years, twenty five years, and their kids have left the house and they're staring at each other in the kitchen, wondering why they got married. Because their purpose for getting married was children. The children are gone. Their purpose for marriage is gone. Right. And if it's for, for working out, you see many people meet at you know, um, yoga classes and they meet at softball games and they marathons and they, and, and they get married based on that commonality. And then as they get older, first of all, they find they don't work out together anymore because they have separate schedules. And then when working out becomes not their focus, they don't have something common, more meaningful than just physical. Same thing with goes with money. Same thing goes with working out. Same thing goes with kids. You have to have a common higher purpose. That's more than just physical. In my opinion, it's spiritual. God down into you have to have God into your relationship. So you mentioned today Hashgacha Pratis HP. That means God's intervention in our world, which He always does. He always comes down in our world and gives bad things and good things. They're all for us. Jason and I, my husband's name is Jason Davis. Spectacular. By the way, he's before I interrupt you. Yes. He's a he's a wonderful uh, singer and artist. I've seen him perform many times, even here in Jerusalem. And I just he reminds me of Sting when I see one thing. It's like it's like I feel like I'm seeing a Sting concert, yeah. but he's even more soul. He's like there's something about it, like you just want to hug him, you, you know? Do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you definitely do. Yeah, you definitely do. <laughs> and I definitely do, but I didn't always. And the first ten years of our marriage were not wonderful. They really were not. So what what was the trigger that got you to improve your marriage? Um. Well, interestingly enough, I uh, I was working in television. He was also a scenic artist in the film world, so he would create sets. So, for example, um, I, I don't know if you would remember this, Danny, you might, or maybe you from your youth, you speak to you from old animorphs, where animals and people sort of morphed into each other. It was a kid's show. So, you know, he would have to, like, paint a harness on a real alligator so that it could be held off set and paint the harness into the alligator while someone's sitting on the alligator's mouth. Are you serious? Yeah. Or, or for example, figure out how to have blood that could wash off the set. So he created this great concoction of liquid tide and this particular pen. Wow. So he was an artist. That's neat. Well, I was at, I was in front of the camera. He was behind the camera. And, uh, and you overlapped on a show that you were working on? Never. No. But what was cool about the first time I got my own show, not as a guest as someone else's, I remember him looking at me. He said, do me a favor. Don't be a host. I said, but I am the host. He said, I know. Don't be the host. And he said, do you understand what the back of the house does? Do you understand that the, the cameraman and the scenic and the artist and the gaffer and the this and the, do you understand that you got nothing without them? And I went, yeah, I do understand that actually. But it made a huge difference in my relationship with the people I worked on set with. You treated them better. Well, yeah. I would it anyway. Yes. But I guess he had his own next. Right. But I think we're, so, so no, we never worked together on that. But I will say that during the course of, of 
our marriage, um, we decided to put our children into the Jewish day school system. And I have to be completely uh, transparent. We didn't do it for any um, reason Jewish. Like it says, there was a new school and everyone wanted to get their kids to do it. And it was the school where all the, you know, the Jewish kind of who's who were sending their kids if you could get your kid in. Oh, were you, so you were, were you connected to Judaism when you made that decision? Not really. No. Just that was the school to send the kids. That is the thing in Toronto. I'm ashamed to admit it. Okay. And if I'm completely um, open and, and I do have permission to do so, my husband wasn't even Jewish. When I met my husband, he was well, the punk rock musician. So we still is. No, I'm just kidding. He's a sweetheart. No, that punk. Less punky, less eyeliner, less, you know, uh, missing a front tooth and spiky. When you came to my house about four years ago yeah. and he performed at our oh, right. show, I started dressing like him. Yeah, I started. I, I, I saw him. Yeah, I thought he was the coolest. I still do. I, I still think he's the coolest thing. <laughs> because the black and white thing, it's very nice, but you know, it's ubiquitous. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, you know, he was this amazing guy, and I was 30, and I was so afraid that I was not going to find my Bashir, my life partner. Mm -hmm. Terrified. I knew what was expected of me. I knew I should marry a Jewish man. I knew that I should have a Jewish family, secular like my family, but. But there was, you know, an understanding. My, you know, my grandparents have have you know European accents. So I knew what was expected of me. But by the time I hit twenty nine, I was so terrified that he wasn't there, or he wouldn't want me, or that somehow that biological clock was running out of time, and I'd never have children. And of course, I'd end up a hundred years old with twenty cats, and like I had the whole thing measured out yeah. in fear. I meet this man, and he's crazy for me. I mean, crazy for me. And I didn't, I, I didn't want to pass it up. I don't even think I cared for him as much as he cared for me at the beginning. For some reason, and maybe it's because I wasn't desperate, you know, or because mm -hmm. I didn't think he was going to be right. Maybe I played the game without playing the game, but he was totally into me. He told me he was going to marry me within the first week, and I laughed, uh, you know. And I realized, I came to understand that he was one of the finest human beings I had ever met. Like, goodness, as Daniel said, he's, you know, aside from the fact that he's, you know, handsome and hip and all of those things, he's, he's an angel. He's guileless. But you didn't see this at the time. Yeah, you were, you, while you were dating, didn't you? Yes. I him. He was attracted to nice. Uh, I was an adorable girl at 29 who was looking for some nasty guy, you know, to win over. And he was nice. You were looking for a punk rock, punk rocker. Yeah, but he, he looked one way and he behaved another. Right. It was very confusing for me. <laughs> and anyway, I ended up um, realizing that he was a gem. And when he asked me the fourth time to marry him, I decided that I would do so. My grandfather cut my father out of his will for allowing me um, to marry out of faith. He had $5,000 in the will and there were five kids, but never mind. He came up with a huge loss. But a dramatic move that created some family tension. He said to me, he loved me. We were very close. And he said, promise me you'll raise the children Jewish. I said, for sure I will. Absolutely I will. What did that mean for you to raise them Jewish? As a secular, if I didn't know, if I didn't know. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what secular Judaism says. This is, or the way I was raised. That's not fair to say. Mm -hmm. People mistakenly use denominations in order to say, oh, if you're Orthodox, you're the most religious. And if you're Reformed, you're the least. It's not true. Those are just different ideologies. Mm -hmm. Secular and unaffiliated is what I was. Secular and unaffiliated. And the double landing. Okay. Yes. Um, but that didn't mean that my mother didn't occasionally light candles and that we didn't, you know, celebrate the holidays in our own way. Mm -hmm. We did. We knew we were Jewish. The problem was, the under message was, you know, if you scratch under the surface, everyone hates us and you'll end up getting married to someone who isn't Jewish and they'll be anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism is the religion of secularism. Mm -hmm. People say stay with each other because they hate us. And I couldn't live in an us-them world. Even today, I should tell you, I'm allergic to us-them mentality. I feel the same way. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. I'll <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> You're welcome. It's hard to find people who are not not comfortable or willing to sit in a box and don't wish to put other people there for their own comfort level either. Mm -hmm. So here was this man. Right. I married him. We had two children. He couldn't hold the babies, my two sons. He couldn't hold them during the Brit Milah because he was Jewish and the boy old the rabbi wouldn't let him hold him. Not long after the second one was born, maybe a year or two later, uh, we were at my mother's and he picked up a, a Canadian Jewish news, it's not in publication anymore, and he read an article about a couple where the husband, the wife died, the wife wasn't Jewish, and so she couldn't be buried beside her husband in the Jewish cemetery. Or oh, yeah. wigged out. He said, you're telling me I can't be buried beside you? And I should just tell you the whole time I'm thinking, well, maybe she said we're going to be together until we know. Oh, uh, I'm like still, I'm, I'm still not committed. Right. Not in. We're married already seven years. Two kids. Really? Two kids. Seven years. And he, am I going to tell you, leaving a door, an unconscious exit sign in your marriage is very common. People just don't admit it. Oh, well, this doesn't work. And I can just say it wasn't Jewish. Right? That was wow. actually my thing. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So I had these two kids and I had the exit signs, you know, blaring. And I, I just said, so who cares if we're not buried beside each other? What, what you think you're going to, I'm going to make you dinner under there? What the whole <laughs> What? You think we're going to hold hands? Like, we'll be dead. Nothing happens <laughs> after you die. That's what he thought. And, and you told that to him? Yes. No, yeah. Said, well, Adrian, I don't believe in the church I was raised in. But I do believe in God. And I believe that there is something after you die. He was more religious than you. Yeah. And I said, spiritual, I should say. Great way to finish it. Yeah. And then I said, well, I believe in worm and maggot. That's what I believe in. And he said, well, I think I'm going to go and convert because I want to be buried together. Wow. Honestly, for that reason, it's so romantic. And I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> you read the conversation <laughs> so unromantic. I want to break in for a second. Yeah. Great story is that when I was on my Jewish journey myself, yeah. I used to go to funerals sometimes, didn't think about it. And then when I started to understand the body soul, we have, we, we, are, we have a body that we're loan, on loan to, yeah. but we are a soul. Like, our soul's going to live forever. It's us. Yeah. Soul's up. And I go to these funerals in Montgomery County, Maryland, and they're burying these bodies in these, I guess it's by law in many places, where they have to bury it in a concrete thing. Like, you have the wooden box, which you get buried in a wooden box, but they put that, they, they take some dirt and put it in this hot, big piece of concrete inside the earth, put some dirt in there, and they put the box in the concrete, and they have a lid of concrete. So you're buried in concrete. I mean, there's some dirt in there also, but... What's the purpose? It's by law. It's a law in some place. You, like here in Israel, you get buried literally. You just go right into the ground. And, and it's like a... Right. It's a cloth. No casket. There's nothing. No casket. No nothing. There you, you go into a casket inside of concrete. I go, if we're a body and a soul, and like the Torah says that you, we're gonna, we have to be buried back into the ground. Like we, we are from the ground. We're a piece of dirt holy dirt, which is holy, and a breath of God, God's soul, but we have to go back into the ground where we started. That's part of our life cycle. I'm like, and if I get buried in Montgomery County, Maryland, I'm going to be buried in a task and, 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 and concrete. I go, I don't be in concrete. I, and this is what I, my first like tinkling. And you're right. Mm -hmm. It's the first tinkling of me wanting to move to Israel because I had, I had this one, I had lung cancer. I'm like, you I'm understand. like, yeah, I'm like, I don't bury in concrete. Yeah. yeah. That can start your journey off. It's crazy. Wow. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah, I'm like, I, I go to Yolanda, whatever house, because I had lung, I just had lung cancer. I'm like, hey, who knows is going to, you know, whatever. You always have lung cancer. But I said, if I, I go, I do not want to be buried like this. This is not happening. I go, I think about moving to Israel. Because at least I get to die here. At least I know I'm going to the ground, you know? I'd rather die, I'd rather die here, like, for meeting purpose and die there for, like, money. Like, it's, you know, it's like, and, like, that, that's what started my journey. That's something we really share. It's so interesting that yeah. both of us, we're triggered by burial. Burial. Yeah. Wow. Go and seek her. And it's and if the whole concept of Jewish heaven and hell is so interesting. We had, as you know, Lori and Yaakov Rabbi Plata and Lori Plata on about heaven and hell. It was our greatest episode because it's such it's such a different mind change or a mindset how people think. Oh, you go to the ground and get buried even by worms. No, we're souls. Our souls live forever. You know, and our souls sometimes have to go to hell, which is Gehenna, to. Basically, it's like the, you know, the hospital for the souls. You know, we have a hospital here in Jerusalem 
Thank God. I hope I never have to go there. But I like it being there. I like to know that, okay, if I have to get something done there and get operation or look for us, I know where to go. But I don't want to go there. I'm going to give you a fashion reference of this because that's my history, okay? You used a hospital for the soul. I like to think of it as dry cleaning for a white jacket you borrowed from your friend. Yeah. Let's say you borrow a white jacket from your girlfriend. Yeah. It's a gorgeous jacket. She paid a fortune for it. You really want it for your date with you, Brendan. And, and you go out and you spill red wine on it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you spill red wine on it. And you're like, oh, no, what am I going to do? First of all, I can't afford to replace this. Uh-huh. So you take it to the dry cleaners and they clean it. And you get it back, and it's not entirely out. Oops. So you have to send it back to another dry cleaner. Then you have it spot cleaned, and then you run on it because you don't want to return that jacket unless it's pristine. Mm-hmm. So my understanding from a fashion for <laughs> you is that when you die, your soul goes to Gehenna, which is dry cleaning for the soul. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that in that, the amount of time you spend there depends on how many stains there are on that car. <laughs> right. <laughs> So it's better to clean them while you're alive. Right. And it is, you know, so that's my, you go to the hospital, I'm going to. I like your analogy. I like it, yeah. yeah. I got to make one for coins. I'm a big into analogies. I think stories and muscles and like, you know, anal- you know, so I, I, I was doing it. Yeah, you have to do it for coins. Yeah. So, okay, so anyway, so my husband said this and he said, I'm going to go and convert. And I said, knock yourself out and leave me alone. I went to Jew jail. You know, I right. went to Sunday school. It was not my thing. Okay. And then you'll excuse me, this cold ice. Anyhow. So off I went, or off he went, and he was in the middle of the first session, and he came back and he goes, you know, this is like Coke light. This is not what I'm looking for. Was he, what kind of conversion was he going through? Uh, you know what? I prefer not to talk about That's okay. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. I'm, 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 I'm the same yeah. I think to those nations are a construct. I agree with what you're telling us. Yes. Telling us. Yes. I, I really think they're a construct. We're all Jewish. I, I tell people, you know, when Brandon was on the momentum trip last week, I yeah. talked to some guy, they go, we are all the exact same Jews. Some do more, you know, the mitzvahs, some do less than this, but you were, the, you were just the same Jewish as the greatest rabbi in the world. That's correct. So, you know, I, I understand why you were asking, because it, it does make sense with, with the story that I'm telling you, but um, it, he just found that the educator was not giving him what he needed. Okay. So he um, decided to go to a higher level of ritual observance community. Mm-hmm. And but not as high as he'd go eventually. Anyway, so <laughs> he he said, you have to come with us. I'm not going with. He said, you have to come. It's once a week. It's two hours on a Tuesday night. I said, I'm not going with my lips. No. And uh, he said, what have I ever asked of you? You have to come with me. So I went to watch a 40-year-old man from the Midwest of Canada try and make the <laughs> Sam <laughs> try to learn to make kiddush, right? All of those things. And uh, and I laughed my way through the whole thing. I have to be honest. I laughed my way through the whole thing. And finally, you were cynical. Man, were you cynical? He's an angel to stay with you. Content, what I'm going to tell you next. So he... He finishes finally. Yeah, they they put him in the make file, which is what you do when you're a geared sadic, when you're a righteous convert. Put him in the make file. You know, fortunately, to be not indelicate, he was did not require a Brit Milan, but they still have to pen shoot. They stay pen, yeah. It's a little pen needle. Yeah. So, and um, anyway, so oh god. So, yeah, so he, that's what we did, and uh, he was all excited, and then shortly after that, he decided that he wanted our house to be kosher, but so kosher that any of our new friends that we were going to a synagogue, you know, so our kid could have, like, a an experience, synagogue happened to be a traditional synagogue, you know, like an orthodox synagogue, traditional. He said, I want the house to be so kosher, anyone will eat in it. So I did what you do. It's called Chabad. <laughs> that's what you do. They, they'll come and they'll do anything. They're amazing. I called Chabad, and I guess they recognized my name from television, and they were like, <laughs> so they sent down somebody edible, uh, that really powerful, big, holy dude. And in my living room, he came. My husband was so excited. You know, he said, I put on to fill it every day. 
pray every day, and I, you know, my wife is going to go to the mikvah. Do you agree to this? Yeah, with my eyes rolled. You weren't bought in. And he said, uh, he said, but I'd like to have a kosher house. And I guess he kind of went, how does he not have a kosher house? Right. So he says, can I see your conversion, conversion certificate? Now, this is clarity. This is a moment of clarity. If the only thing that comes out of this podcast is this, this is what I want the world to hear. If you have to give bad news or what we call tolkhacha, which means proof or negative feedback to somebody, anything that might cause them any amount of pain, if you have to do that, it should hurt you more than it hurts them. Mm. This rabbi looks at the certificate. He's sitting on this footstool. I'm like, I, I can see it like it's yesterday. And it's like 24 years ago. And all I see is tears pouring off his beard. Well, wow. he's just sitting there. His shoulders are going, you know, that it's either you want to laugh at the Pesach Seder table and you don't want your father to kick you into the fever or you're sobbing and you're trying to be quiet, right? He's bawling his eyes out. No. And I'm like, what? And he looks up and he looks at us and he says to Jason, Adrian can have pork on Yom Kippur and she will always be Jewish. I'm sorry to tell you that your conversion isn't kosher. I was so offended. I stood up and I took my finger out like I do. This, the mommy finger? Oh, oh, oh. My husband takes my hand, excuse me, and pushes it down. And he says, I know. And I'm like, what? He says, I know. I read that when you have a proper conversion, it's as though your soul shifts. He said, I'm happy on every level, but I don't think it took. I'd like to start again. Goodness. And now I thought I'm going to take a razor blade and start slicing my red spoons. No way. No way I'm going through this again. So they took him to the Beit Den, the rabbinical court, the new rabbinical court, which was like, looked like ZZ Top, four men with beards down to their waist, yeah. you know, like really scary looking. But at this point, I had my television show. I was on the side of buses, you know. Wow. You were famous. You are a celebrity. Yeah. Can you walk, at this point in time, can you walk into any restaurant without being recognized? Like, never recognize you. Anywhere without being res recognized at that point, which I loved because yeah. my ego was just shaky enough that I needed it. Mm -hmm. but I should tell you that within a year and a half after my TV show ended and I changed my life, people used to come up to me on the street and say this. Didn't you used to be Adrian? Mm -hmm. Ah, got it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And Jane Smith now. Yeah. <laughs> So honestly, he, um, we went to see this rabbinical court. They talked to the two of us for a while. They asked Jason to leave. And they said to me, your husband is a tzaddik. He's a holy person. We were taking today. Ah, you're the problem. You are cynical. Cynical. Right. You are jaded. You're angry. You all support him. We can't have that. Yeah. And so... I think you need to look into what it is he wants to look into, and we'll talk about it then. And then I just start to cry because one of them said, why did you marry him in the first place? I just bawled my eyes out in a way that I couldn't do therapy ever. Well. I said, because I was afraid that no man was going to ever want to marry me, that I'd be single forever, that I'd be lonely, that I wouldn't have children, and he wanted me. I got to tell you guys, and anyone else who's listening to this, I would say that the majority of intermarriage is not because of a lack of interest in Judaism. It comes from a fear that there will not be another person who will love you, because we just want to be loved and to love someone else. That's what we want. And one of the rabbis said to me, now we have a human being we can deal with. Go and learn, see what you think. Well, wow. He was in the room for that. No. No. Okay. We will. On your own. And with a be. No, they are on my own in terms of not together. He had his yeah. own. But yes. And I learned the kind of Torah, you know, Coach Ratner, that you teach. The kind of Torah that you guys do on this Torah time, Torah for living, things 
that create an operating system that improve every piece of your life, from your romantic life to your financial life to every component. And I went, this I like, this I did. Was this dramatically different than what you expected? I had no idea. And I came to understand that everything that I thought of is I can't eat that, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this here, you can't do that here. Right. I used to think, oh, for heaven's sake, stop micromanaging. And then I realized all that is, and because I was very new aging, all that is, is heightened consciousness on every level of human behavior. The way you eat, the way you drink, the way you sanctify time, the way you make love, everything. The way you speak. The way you speak. For sure, yes. Yeah. And I thought, I'm so busy taking those mindfulness courses, and here it is in my own backyard. Yeah. And then I went, I get this, and I think it's true. And so I went from broad out of prayer and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember this whole thing that I went through myself so because I grew I grew up as a you know, secular Jew. Yeah. You know, I was I was related to you know one of the movements, whatever, and I uh, and then you know we got married and my wife was you know, she was more traditional than I was, but we do Shabbat dinner sometimes and then. We met a, a representative, as you know, Lori Plotnick, and uh, she just rocked my world. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, cause I, you know the, the reason we call the show Living Clarity is because I like living in clarity. I like living my relationships, with my finances, with how I speak, and everything. I like, I don't like living what I call um, contradiction or shekher. They call fakeness. Like, I like truth. And it came to the point in time that I had to realize, okay, either or there was a God who gave us a Torah. The Jewish people are, or there's not. And if it's not a God who gave us a Torah, that means a man or men or women or group of women had to write it. And if that's the case, and I fasting when I'm Kippur, I'm an idiot. Yes, exactly. I mean, like, why would I follow what I mean? If I'm going to pick a religion that a man wrote, I might as well pick Scientology. I could hang up with Tom Cruise. Like, yeah. you know, like, you know what? I'm not going to do this. So I had to think, is this real or not? And so I started doing my own research. And I'm not like, I am not spiritual. I am not like, Me I don't either. I am not spiritual. I don't believe in, you know, faith. What is faith is blind belief in something without any evidence. Yeah. I got to have evidence. And so I started looking at the evidence. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I said, at first, at first with determination whether it's a God or not, and that's easy. Because you just look at our bodies and the universe. It's, it just has to be a creator because everything in this world has a purpose. There's nothing that's not created without a purpose. And then I said, okay, did God write the toe? Did, did God give the toe to the Jewish people? And when I started taking classes, and I went to to class Asia Torah called Discovery, and I discovery, and I'm like, because oh, I was, you know, I was, I was kind of like a jet setter. I'd go ski in Vail when I had fresh powder. Oh yeah, I was. I'd go to Vegas all the time for trade shows and for fun. But I'd you know I'd be jet skiing in the Colorado River above the Hoover Dam, below the Hoover Dam. We used to play football and jet skis. Like I I had a pretty sweet life, right? But this would change everything because now I had like, you know, keep kosher, it's like Shabbos, and it's a big life change. But when I got the clarity that I believe that God gave us the Torah and wants us to be great and our purpose for the world, to basically to take responsibility for the world as Jewish people, I'm like, I better start learning. <laughs> I mean, and I didn't want to. I was working on Saturdays, making money, working out. Like, it was the last thing I ever had. I said to my wife, if you wanted to marry an Orthodox guy, you ran the wrong guy. I'm like, I'm not your guy. Like, but the problem was, I, I, I couldn't get around the fact that there was too much evidence to show that this was given to the Jewish people. You know, I feel the same way, but there are plenty of people who don't see that as evidence. And in my life... Well, they haven't learned yet. No, even people who have learned, who choose that it's not evidence. I, I, I say this because I think it's really important to know that what was clear, which was clarity for me and for you, absolute does not translate the same for everybody i have to tell you from my small experience that i've been teaching at these classes down in old city with hashem i go thank god i get a lot of students and the ones that come from religious uh, of different backgrounds that are going through friction in their life right now I, it, a lot of it comes comes from dysfunction or depression or some other thing in their life that is keeping them from you know connecting and i, I i'm not sure like I'm not, I'm not sure that that many people actually sit down and learn Torah 
and say, and learn, like seriously learn for like, you know, a month or two and just walk up, yeah, it's all nothing. I, I, I think it, I, I don't think that's. I don't know that I'm saying that it's all nothing. What I'm saying is, is that you can learn it and see its value and believe in all that and not practice. You can. Yeah, you can, but it, you, we're only seeing a short time span. Like we're only seeing this person that, that you're talking about in the thirties and forties and fifties. It could be in their seventies and eighties, which I have seen. People finally said, oh, okay, now it's time to adopt in every day. Now it's time to wrap the fill in. And it just took 30 years, that's all. That's a very, you know, there's a midrash. I, I can't remember where it's from. That after Abraham, Avram Avinu, um, had some guy come into his tent, and the guy had idols in his pocket. Do you know this one? I don't remember this one. Yeah, he has. He had his idols in his pocket, and, um, you know, Abraham spends the entire evening trying to uh, convince him to you know, say grace after meals and to not, you know, bless his idols. After all of these hours, the guy takes out his idols and he kisses them. And Abraham chases them away. Get out, get out. You know, he's so furious. And essentially God says to him, I waited 90 years for you and you gave up on that guy? Yeah, right. After one night, go get him back. And Abraham leaves the tent and goes to find the man. So, you know, there's what you're saying. There's obviously a lot of sources for what you're saying. I have so many instances in my life where I've, you know, talked to someone, met some. There was a story actually was, I think, you might have been here. It was 2019. We went to a dinner, momentum dinner at Aish on Friday night. And um, and a woman from Washington, D.C. spoke. You know, they speak for a few minutes. And she came to me afterwards. Oh, she, no, she announced this to the whole crowd. She said, seven years earlier, that me, I hosted a, a marriage class in my house in Rockville, Maryland, given by Lori Plotnick. And she said, I came. Yeah, she didn't know me. I didn't know her at the time. We had like 70, 80 people. It was great. It was a great class. She goes, I had no idea how that affected me and how my marriage changed for the better after that. I had a good marriage, but it's much better now. She says, and the only reason my trip, because Daniel Ratner hosted that class seven years ago at his house. That's so that's nothing. You have no idea of how what you do in your life. I always say anyone can change the world. We all have that potential, right? And when I give, I'm giving a class now on um, persuasion, and that you go into any situation, if you're meeting your lowest level employee or someone who's a trash man or someone who's just a clerk, you don't know what they can do in their life, and you have to go into any situation you're going to thinking that this person can make a difference in the world. Yeah. And when you go in that, you'll have a lot more energy and more gumption, more power, because you know that you can make a change, even with a little, something low level. Listen, I would tell you there's no such thing as a low level. Yeah. Okay? Number one, there's no such thing as a low level. The truth is, is that we um, we have ascribed to modernity uh, that which is considered high level and that which is considered low level. And okay. that whatever anyone is doing to contribute to the functionality of this world without it leaves such a void that it makes it's like you, you can have a brand new maserati but if the lug nuts fall off you know the ten dollar lug nut fall off doesn't work it's not working. Yeah. no so so for me a big part a big push in my life is to recognize the holistic nature of humanity to to recognize that there is no lower, there is no higher, there is no this, there is no that. There is just where you are in this moment. That's where you are. That's where you're standing. Be great in that dynamic, whether you're washing the floor or you're changing a lug nut or you're brushing your hair or you're ordering a smoothie. Yeah. That's it. That's all we have. And, you know, when you live that way, your life, is suffused with joy every single minute because you know there used to be in the fashion industry nothing tastes as good as skinny feels i don't know if you've ever heard that expression. i have not you know boy it's the disordered eating is terrible i'm telling you nothing tastes as good as holy feels now what's holy for me holiness is to recognize that when I look at you, Brandon, when I look at you, Daniel, when I look at anybody, I am glimpsing a piece of the divine. And it was gifted to me in that second. And I owe them their props, as my kids say. And they are props. They are no, they're props. They're judging, to the, judging fairly. I oh, judging fairly. The cover of the respect. Yes. And 
that when I conflute that person's thing that they do with who they are, only I miss out. And my life now, I don't have, I don't seek out meaningful experiences anymore because everything, everything's meaningful. everything is meaningful. And when you compare and contrast that to meaningful as defined by what color is in this season or what length the skirt is or if that handbag goes with those shoes or whatever. Listen, don't get me wrong. I still am very aesthetically driven. I love beauty. And, you know, just as there's a concept in Judaism to beautify the mitzvahs, there is nothing wrong whatsoever with taking joy and pleasure in aesthetic thing. You know, I, I'm staying right near the Betzalel Art College. You know, and Betzalel from the Torah, who was a craftsman, would have been considered a craftsman, right? My right. son, the artist, who's into that? But Betzalel merited to build the traveling sanctuary that we went through the desert with because he was wise. There's some, there's a place for everyone. And the fashion industry has some tremendous, tremendous things. But when I found my space, all I wanted to do was use the 15 years of communication skills that I'd garnered on live television to teach people what somebody had taught me at 40. Wow. Just like Rabbi Akiva. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Don't even go there. If somebody said that to me before, it makes me, it freaks me out because, you know, I'll abide. Like, like what, what's that expression you see in Hebrew when, like, when you say something and it shouldn't? Oh, uh, um... You know what I'm saying? Too, too, too. No, not that. There's something else where you say, like, I, I don't know. It's gone for me for a minute. It'll come back to me. But but honestly, and no, Rabbi Akiva's the real thing. Um, for our viewers, Rabbi Akiva was, uh, he was a servant. And at 40 years old, he, his wife, or the, the lady who was the the daughter of his master, told him, told, like, told the dad that he she wanted to marry him that he's got potential and the dad kicked him out of the family or kicked her out of the family, family. yeah they give her any no 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 uh no okay. money no nothing they lived in literally poverty and she said that she would marry him on the based on whether he's going to go to yeshiva for 12 years which he did and became one of the greatest sages of all time so it doesn't surprise me that we are recording this today that's right. Oh, which is wow, that's amazing. Pretty ironic, given you said that today is the day that Shimon Bar Yochai died. Yes, it's the, the day that all of Rabbi Akiva's students stopped dying. They didn't die on this day. They a hundred, I guess, it was twenty-four thousand students died every day from the second day of Passover until the thirty-third day of the Omer, which is today. And do you remember why they died? Because of uh, they were not treating each other nicely. That's correct. And. So why would we celebrate that? You know, they, they, they stopped dying, but they still died. Yeah. Because Rabbi Akiva started over. Mm -hmm. Because every single day, you know, I had a, I had a big career. I started over. Wow. You know what? At 58, I left my other career, the one in, then I worked in Toronto as a community leader for the Jewish community. And I went to work full time for Momentum, as you can see on my, I went to work for Momentum, which is the, in my opinion, most extraordinary movement around the world where essentially we take women with children under 18 in the home who are deeply unaffiliated on a one year journey of growth year of growth into discovering their jewish souls and to reinvesting in and reclaiming their jewish heritage for themselves and for everybody else around them, because if you impact a woman, you can impact the entire family. And if you can impact enough families, you can change communities. And if you can change enough communities, you can change the world. And at 58 years old, I started a new job. Well, you know what? I might change something else at 78, because until the day I die, till the day I die, I am searching for me. And you're in control of that trajectory. At every stage. I'm in control of choosing mm -hmm. trajectory. I'm in control of choosing search for clarity. I'm in control of my efforts. Outcomes from heaven. 
That's definitely true. Wow. So you really had a great career and you shifted to for more meaning and then more meaning. But how much of a, how hard was that first decision? Because it's, the, the first decision is always the hardest. Yeah. I mean, my, like how long did it take you to go when you t start, when those rabbis are sitting in the room crying, right? There's rabbis telling you, just go learn and then come back. How long did it take you, first of all, how long did it take you to come back? Right. And how long did it take you to get to a point where you could be a teacher? Mm -hmm. So interestingly, we were married one year to about a year to the day. You were remarried. Remarried again. Yes, married again. Under a chuppah that was held by the rabbinical court, the Beit Din. Wow. With like four of the biggest rabbis from all different walks of, there was the head of Chabad, and there was the head of the Buddha, and there was the head of the modern Orthodox movement, and there was the, the chief rabbi, Sephardic rabbi, and it was, they wow. held my chuppah. My husband's hair was wet from going in the mikvah when he <laughs> signed the ketubah, like all of that stuff. And, um... And after that, I'd already been learning for like four years, three or four years. And after that, about a year and a half after that, in in 2002, I just thought, this is what I want to do. I want to give somebody else what somebody gave me. And I went to um, the Village Shul, an Ishtar Learning Center in Toronto, very, a very, very large community, Jewish community. And I asked the rabbi, I said, it says in our sources that if you know Aleph, you should teach Aleph. I have a lot of Aleph. <laughs> and I think people will come. I think women will come because they'll be curious and then probably want a wardrobe consultation afterwards. But Fine. eventually they'll forget about that. Yeah. And that's what I'll do. Well, he laughed. He did? He laughed. He said, what, if, what do you mean? And I convinced him and he took me to, and this is another thing. He took me to one of their donors. A very philanthropic, generous couple. And he said, tell them what you want to do. And I did. And do you know they funded my salary for two years because oh. they believed that I could transfer the skills that I'd had 15 years on television into the Jewish community. They believed they were transferable. And they made an investment. Two years set. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's amazing. So he could hire me, and it took off pretty much from the start. I'm sure it did. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's very similar to my story, our stories again. Tell me. I, uh, I used to play piano when I was younger, and I was very good, and everyone told me I was really good. And then I liked making people, I liked being on stage. I, I used to sing and dance, but really, I was, a, I was a piano player. And I enjoy playing, I like making people feel good, like being on stage, you know, it, you sit there and play, and they feel great, and they're happy, it makes me happy, throw me money. You know, because they used to do, I used to go to Nordstrom's and sit down and play piano firmly. And, uh, I, I'm not, I'm a whole lot of story, but I'm not going into the music business, but I became a coin dealer. And while I was a coin dealer, I was considered one of the world's best graders in coins, like evaluators. And so there was a seminar in Colorado and they asked me to teach. So I'd never taught before my life. And so I went there and I found out I was a really good, people love my classes because, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there, I, we pass around coins. And the grade was covered, and people have to grade it and give their what they think of the coin. And I have to explain to them what I see without knowing the grade. I didn't know the grade. And most of the time I was right, but I had to explain to them what I saw and why it came to my opinions. And they loved my classes. In fact, one of the largest coin dealers today, his name's um, Ryan Carroll, is in Dallas, Texas, at Heritage. He was 16 years old and he was in my class. Huh. Now, I don't know if that was my reason that he did it, but it certainly didn't hurt. Anyway, so um, I, tried, I found I was a good teacher. And so I thought, that's pretty good. And then after we got married, after we had Liam, we uh, we met Lori Palatnik and started going to classes. And Lori would bring down to Washington, D.C. these great speakers because she had a good, was friendly with them. So Charlie, Har Charlie Harari would come down to Washington, to Rockville, to JCC, and Rav Gov Friedman and Ken Spiro, all these great speakers. And every time I saw them, I'm like, that's what I want to do. Oh, and you are now. I did. That's what I did. I go. How do I get there? How do I get? How do I get from where I am now as a coin dealer, to becoming a speaker? I was. Uh, this is like two. This is like two thousand eight nine. So I was uh, forty. Forty three, forty four. Forty five. Like you know, yeah, forty five. And then, um, and unfortunately, I got lung cancer. I say, you know, everything's a puzzle in my life. 
it all they all play a part coins you know and everything and then that was a trick that was a trigger i was looking for a trigger to like start doing something Lori Lori comes into the hospital sibley hospital in dc and she goes this is going to make a great class someday i'm like i had my lung taken out it was i had my lung i had my lung removed and Wait, i'm like you have one? i'm missing a lobe yeah you remember I, we were, we we're walking the stairs just to get in the That's studio cool. i said yeah i'm missing a lung this is where it hurts Okay, I didn't hear that part of it. <laughs> yeah, I lost the lung. So I, I uh, when I was in the hospital with, she was in the hospital, I said, this is going to make a good class. So literally, my mind, I always had crazy ideas. I wrote a class on greatness. I used the, the acronym GREAT, Gratitude, Responsibility, Endgame, Awesome, and Torah. That was my first class. And I started, whatever, we were in Washington. There was not nothing being done on Friday nights. So I'm like, we need to have something going on. This is ridiculous. We have a community that's growing, it's learning. Like, why don't we have dinner, talk? Like, I'm going to do it. So I started writing talks. And like every three months, I did called living. I, I was called get fired up on Friday nights. I give a talk. I pay for the Chinese food. I let the show have the money. They charge for it. I set it up. I clean it up. I did everything. I had to organize everything. And I started writing classes. You know, get in the game, how to skate in four feet of snow. I took my personal experiences of life, of my life, and I turned it into Torah. You know, and uh, that's how I started writing classes. My kids tell me that everything is a story, and they're tired of the stories about them. And could I move on to some new stories? Yeah, you know? I'm writing stuff. You, you, if you're not, if you're not writing and improving the ones you have, you're gonna die. You've got, you've got to. In this last few months, I've been really expanding my classes, including classes on persuasion and classes on self-esteem, which I've been giving. It's been huge. In fact, Brian and I are doing podcasts on it. We're doing podcasts on self-esteem, so we have some more to fill. And I improve my old classes, my dating and marriage classes. I'm always, I'm always upgrading them. I'll just tell you something vis-a-vis self-esteem. The job of the fashion industry, and certainly most of what I did, was work to undermine. Yes, self-esteem. make you feel bad. So that, you know, if you're too fat, too too thin, too tall, too short, too, your skin's too dry, it's too oily, too T-zone, your hair's too curly, it's too straight. You know, whatever it is, you create something that cannot be achieved. And if you create something that cannot be achieved, then people will run around trying to find it. The same thing is true with the romantic film industry. People create imagery that is impossible. You know, for a young man like you, who's probably going to get married in the next five years or so, God willing. I wasn't sure. Yeah. You need to know that, that you have been inculcated, just completely snowed in by false narratives about love and romance. You won't recognize it when you when you meet somebody, but your old brain is going to go to look for that bell to ring. I guess what I'm saying is that I didn't just learn how to, I didn't just start performing soul first because I didn't like how I looked. When we spend an equal and slightly greater amount of time working on our inner world than we do on our outer world. I like to call it vitamin T, vitamin Torah. As a former fashion and beauty person, I can tell you that the glow, the highlight that you get from inner beauty, and as men as well, is insane. There is no Botox, there are no shots, there is no anything that supplements your beauty regimen like inner wisdom and peace mm. and a desire to give. Well, that's very valuable advice. And it actually ties into something I wanted to discuss that I saw you talk about on your talk. You had a cup of, oh, you had a bottle of water, you had a cup and you had a bowl. And you said the cup represents the marriage and your relationship. The bowl represents your family. You get one pour. You have to fill up both. The only way to do that is, of course, by putting the larger cup and the smaller cup into the bowl mm-hmm. and then pouring it enough so that it overflows. Uh, in Hebrew, I guess we call it shefa, it's overflowing of uh, or bountiness, where when that is taken care of, the other one can nourish itself off of the success of that one. And now we're talking about really self-esteem. And I was thinking about this idea so much. I loved it. On top of that is another cup where it's you. And below that is your community. And so you have to start with yourself. That's got to overflow. Oh, squeeze it. Can I steal that? You can steal it, absolutely. Yeah, you do not have to. No. Well, that's fantastic. Yes, that's true. 
That's absolutely true. So you need two bowls and a cup. The cup is you, and the, the bowl below it is your marriage, and the bowl below that is your family. And then, it's like a water fountain. And then it keeps going because then you have your community. Yeah. Huh? It's a chocolate. It's a chocolate. It's a chocolate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no water fountain yet, child, but no. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it being called a chocolate wonderfall when we were little. Oh, I love that. I remember my kids wanted that at their bar mitzvah so badly. I had one. Did you? I really wanted it. And it was, that was, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Wow. So that, that I think sums it all up is when you nourish yourself, bring that into your relationship and then prioritize your partner, prioritize your family and let that just spill over. So cup run it though. Yeah, that's right. That, that talk was great. That like, that just put it into such clarity for us. Where, how, where can people find you? Like, you know, you're, I, I, I'm very blessed to be able to sometimes see you here in Jerusalem when you speak. I've heard you talk a lot and it's awesome. I can't wait to hear you again. I had a miss last week because we had, we had guests. I couldn't come. I also would have been there, obviously. Um, so how do people find you? Like, how, where are they, where are they, where are they going to, where can they hear you? How they, I, well, I have a podcast. It comes out once a week. I've done already 18 seasons. So it's a clog of like 175, 180 weekly podcasts. It's called Rise and Shine with Adrian Gold Davis. You can get it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. It is consistently in the top world, top Jewish podcast, the top 20, almost all the time, um, sometimes even higher. And it's actually crossed over into world spirituality, even though it's amazing. World. It is a 10 minute snippet. Why 10 minutes? Because there's no excuse. <laughs> yeah, there, are, there is no excuse. It's 10 valuable minutes. Dishwasher while you're in carpool, while you are driving home, you know, in the bathtub, wherever you've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes, a piece of Jewish wisdom that makes life sweeter and more meaningful. And it is not didactic. I'm not trying to make people be anything or do anything other than think and open up the treasure chest that is Jewish wisdom that is yours either by birth or by conversion. So uh, you have a hundred and you said, whatever you have, a hundred. So it sounds like I'm curious when you're going to put all these together into a book. Because you don't have to, you already, these are already. She's already got the name. You already, you, already, you already have the name of the book and you already have the content of the book. It seems like you should just get someone to put this together and you have a book. I mean, I, a, lot, a lot of writers, uh, their books are literally just like Tony Kornheiser from DC. His book was just basically articles from all his, te from his newspapers. He took, you know, 75 articles and put them in the book. And he has a book and he just, people buy it. Well, it was suggested to me, and because I write and record my own material, I write it all out. And when I write it, I write it as though I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it would, it would need some edits. I do the same thing. Yeah. People read my books. Yeah. They say, Kush, I feel like you're in the room with me. Look, That's how I write. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm going to tell you why I'm not and why thus far I haven't. Um, and this is no judgment whatsoever on anyone who decides, decides to. But I don't feel like I have an original idea in my head. I feel like I have an original life experience. And I think I have an original perspective because we all do from what we come from. But all of the Torah wisdom that I share is something that I got from somebody else. We all do, though. Every, the whole world comes up. Everything that I write is just taking what someone else said and pa pa packaging it in a different way. And the reason why you need to write this book is because... The, the four or five people that read my stuff that it doesn't resonate with them, they're going to read your stuff. It's the same thing, packaged a different way. And guess what? You're going to change their lives. So you're saying I can get four or five people. <laughs> That's why. The four leftover. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about, 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 about a class of 20 people and like they read my book. Like it doesn't, re what I say doesn't resonate. What Lori Plotik says doesn't resonate. What Rabbi, you know, Jones says doesn't resonate. But the way you say it, you're going to affect people that can't get can't get that from somebody else. You are put in this earth for a purpose. I, I tell my students, like, if there is no God, that means you're a random creation by accident and you have no purpose. It doesn't mean you can't find a purpose, but it means you were born without a purpose. You obviously have a purpose and God put you in this world, change the world. And you are not fulfilling your potential in life if you don't take these articles and put them together. In a, and there's not much to do because you've already done it. You've done the hard work. <laughs> 
I'm serious. You've done the hard work. There's no reason you can have a book out, Lily, if you really wanted to, in like a month, if you self-published. You have a knack of reaching people that no one else can knack. And even though it's the same Torah, your packaging is something that people are going to buy. And I gotta tell you, like you, you can, there's stories in Malcolm Gladwell's book how he talks about like when, when they're doing marketing and you put out a flyer, no one, no one yeah. buys it. But they change one color from green to gold, and next thing you know, that everyone buys it, right? You're you you're that color. You're that change that people need in someone's life. And I think that you are not fulfilling your potential if you don't get this book out. And it doesn't mean you're gonna sell them. It doesn't. It just doesn't matter. I, I love it when I was in, I was walking down the beach in the Tanya in, in the Tanya with one of my with one of my friends. Some dude stopped me. He goes, "Hey, are you Coach Ratner?" I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "Cause I just read your dating book." He goes, "You changed everything for me." Mazalto. I'm telling you, you don't know who you're going to affect. Yes, last week at Essentials, I gave my self esteem class. Guy comes up to me. Now I don't have a self esteem book yet, but he comes up to me. Goes, Coach, you just saved my life. You're going to change lives with this book. And I'm telling you, when you go to heaven, you read the notes that God wrote about you. I can guarantee you, there's a book that's written on your, on your biography. When you were born, that God said you're going to be writing books. <laughs> no pressure. Well, well, well. well. <laughs> I'm glad I dropped by today. <laughs> Thank you. I need a good editor, I guess. You guys, I've loved being with you. Thank you so much for having me, for hosting me. It's been very, it's been so easy to talk to you both. And um, yeah. Thank you for like joining. That. And if you're a Jewish woman who's got kids at home and not, a, I guess, you know. Oh, can I talk about that for yeah, a minute? Yeah, yeah. This is momentum. Momentum is essentially birthright for mommies, although we can't use those terms. It is a year-long journey that has at its center, like the jewel in the crown, is a free eight-day trip to Israel. Or I shouldn't say free, highly, highly subsidized. You have to buy your own flight. And you will have eight days away from your responsibilities, your obligations. You'll be somebody's father, somebody's wife, somebody's friend, somebody's employer, someone's employee. You just go back to a place where your vessel is able to receive, and we will fill it with our four goals. Our four goals are to connect to Jewish values, to engage with the land of Israel, to foster unity without uniformity, and to take action in this world. We do it through eight core values, which are easy, easy to incorporate into your life. They're obviously Jewish values, but they're universal as well, and they will impact the way you raise your children, the way you're married. It's an extraordinary experience. You can go on to MomentumUnlimited.org which is the website, and see if there is a, a partner who goes, you know, in your city or your town, take a look, and you can go along with that. You can always uh, listen to my podcast on there, or again, wherever you get your podcast is Adrian. No, what is it? Oh, yeah. Rise and Shine with Adrian Davis on uh, Apple. And if they go on this trip, there's a good chance they're going to have you, right? Yeah. And we've got to clarify for the viewers. It's also for dads. We have dad trips as well. We do. We have dad trips as well. Yeah, because what happens is the women come and they're so transformed. They go, I need my husband to go through this. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. it's it's You know what? I am living large, my friends. I am living large. It's not like I have like a half a million viewers every morning like I did on television. But I have to tell you, it feels bigger and more expansive. And the fact that I have mastery and self-control over my own character like i said makes every day like a holiday that's great before we before we finally wrap up we have our favorite question which is uh do you have one key to clarity that you could offer to our listeners ha ah, i do i have one key to clarity and that is to be very very careful that you don't rationalize you don't tell yourself rational lies there's a very old story little kid uh, or a man, a king, actually, is walking through the woods outside of his castle. And everywhere he looks, there are these perfect bullseyes, these arrows, in perfect bullseyes, this side of the tree, that side, up, yeah, just extraordinary archery. And he thinks, I've got to find whoever the archery is. I need him for my army. So he walks through the um, the clearing until he sees a little house, and there's a quill and choir outside, knocks on the door, and little kid, eight years old, answers. King says, um, young man, and the, the, the child bows low. Your Highness, Your Majesty, he says, do you know who the archer is who shot all those perfect bullseyes? He said, yes, Your Highness, it's me. 
He said, it's you? He said, yes. He said, well, I need you to come back to the palace and I need you to teach my army. We'll never lose another battle. He said, I'd be happy to. And he said, I want you to bring your teacher. If you bring your teacher, then we'll have double of the time it will be done. He goes, oh, no, I taught myself. It's really, really simple, Your Honor. You see, first you shoot the arrow and then you draw the target around. <laughs> this is what it is to rationalize, where you shoot something out of your mouth, you do something, you feel that twinge that says, you know what, this is not right. And then you build a bullseye around it because you can't sit with the cognitive dissonance, the discomfort of, of behaving in a way that's not in line with who you think you are. Stop I love that. rationalizing. Love that. Stop rationalizing. Just pick up the arrow and shoot again. Don't build a target around it. That's how you get clarity because there is nothing that robs clarity like the lies we tell ourselves. That is awesome. Yeah, wow. that, that's great. I'm going to stop drawing bullseyes and start working even harder. Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an inspiring, educating, and an episode full of clarity. Wow, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of the Living in Clarity podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Living in Clarity podcast. If you enjoy what you just heard, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment with any suggestions for future episodes. We'll see you next time.